Hello everyone, welcome to a, another movie discussion video. Today's movie that we'll be discussing is The Dark Knight that was released in 2008, directed by Christopher Nolan. I'm happy to say that I'm joined today by Kat Calamia. Happy to have you on the show here today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I, I love superhero movies in general, and I think this is just such a, a prominent one to talk about. So just to give an introduction to myself, so my name is Sonny Dokia. I have a movie blog website called Hollywood Town. So I do movie reviews across a variety of genres. I have a top five series on actors, composers, and directors. And I also do opinion pieces from time to time on a variety of aspects on the movie industry. So if you want to follow me, you can do so on Twitter at town underscore Hollywood. Instagram, that's hollywood.town, and the same profile username for Facebook as well. And you can also follow me on YouTube, so it's the same username, Hollywood Town. So if you enjoy this video, hit the like and subscribe buttons. And yeah, hit the notification bell for updates on the latest videos. So I'll pass it over to Kat now. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the, uh, the folks watching? Of course. So uh, I'm Kat. Uh, you, you might know me as Comic Uno around the internet. Uh, I've been doing YouTube comic reviews for about a decade now, which is kind of crazy. So uh, I review comics on a weekly basis over there. And then I, I'm also a journalist. So I work for DC Comics, DC Universe, their streaming service. I write articles for them. Um, I also work for Newsarama. So I, I write comic articles over there. Um, I've worked for TV Guide and IGN and Fandom in the past. And uh, also am a comic writer. So I write uh, the books like Father Like Daughter and they call her The Dancer. And I also uh, do podcasts as well. Um, I have a comic podcast I do every Tuesday over on Comic Frontline called Com Comic Book Weekly. And then uh, Legends of Tomorrow, the TV show, I do a podcast called The Legends of Tomorrow Podcast. So if you guys want to follow myself and Kat, you're more than welcome to do so. I'll put all of the links to our various social media channels in the YouTube description below. So be sure to follow Kat. She's doing some amazing work in a minute with regards to her YouTube channel. Uh, so be sure to uh, check her out. So just to give a, a breakdown of the video, so we'll start with a quick summary of the plot that will then be followed by the story and the screenplay. We'll then discuss the acting and the characters involved. We'll then discuss the direction of the movie. The final topic that we'll be discussing is the soundtrack. We'll then give our overall thoughts on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being if we don't really like the movie at all, and 10 being a classic or masterpiece in our opinion of the movie. Also, just to be clear to our viewers, uh, we'll also be using half numbers. So the parameters are you can use either whole numbers or half numbers. So for example, 5.5 or 6.5, for example. Just to give a summary of the plot, so The Dark Knight is a superhero film, and it's a sequel to Batman Begins that was released in 2005. It follows the continued story of Bruce Wayne and Batman, played by Christian Bale. So in this movie, he's teaming up with Police Lieutenant James Gordon, played by Gary Oldman, and the newly appointed district attorney, Harvey Dent, played by Aaron Eckhart. And they form a triumphant, as it were, in terms of trying to get rid of organized crime in Gotham City once and for all. But unfortunately, a criminal mastermind known as the Joker, played by Heath Ledger, arrives in the city with plans of causing anarchy and chaos. And this forms the basis of the movie in terms of making sure that the three try to stop the Joker from carrying out his evil master plan in terms of you know, stopping this anarchy and chaos once and for all. So just to be clear to our viewers, this will be a spoiler warning for the movie. So if you've not seen The Dark Knight, please save the video, uh, put it to a side. And then once you've seen the movie, come back to our discussion. So the first topic that we'll be discussing is the story and screenplay. So the screenwriters for the movie were Jonathan Nolan and his brother, Christopher Nolan. In this movie, they do a great job of crafting a multifaceted and complex story. But the great thing about the screenplay and the story as a whole is that it never feels jumbled or out of place at any point in the movie. And the way they go about achieving this is making sure that characters pivot towards 
either stopping the Joker. So we've got the police force, for example, in Gotham trying to stop the Joker, as well as Batman and, of course, Harvey Dent. Or having characters side with the Joker, uh, in that case, to create anarchy and chaos within Gotham City. And by doing that, by having characters take a side, as it were, it ensures that there's a, a specific purpose and a, a drive to the story so that every scene feels important and that there's no redundancy in terms of what we see on screen. And Christopher Nolan's a master of that in terms of making sure that everything feels fluid, making sure that the a purpose is served. And in the case of this movie, making sure that you know Batman's moral compass, as it was, is put to the test. And that's sort of the driving force in terms of uh, one of the, the, the major themes, as it were, within the movie. Uh, but Kat, just in terms of the screenplay and the story, in terms of the multifaceted aspect of the screenplay, did you get the sense that it sort of was cohesive and was natural to the way the story was told? Or did you get a sense that there was, you know, jumbled in places and it didn't feel organic to what we saw on screen? I never feel like never it's feel jumbled. Like and, and I think that's what's interesting about this film. If you compare it to Batman Begins or even Dark Knight Rises, where some places do feel a little jumbled or long. But why I think The Dark Knight, in some regards, is perfect is because of the the pacing and the way they write this. But what also I think is so interesting and that they dive into is morality, because that's really what a big part of this movie is about in ethics, which, you know, if you're going to talk about a superhero movie, why not test their ethics? You have Joker, who's on one side, Batman on the other, and then... Two-Face, which is right in the middle, and I think with a lot of superhero movies, especially these days with the, you know, the Avengers movies, um, there's usually, you know, one villain. Um, I mean, I think that we're starting to dive into not just having one villain, but back in the Batman, um, you know, Batman days with Michael Keaton, um, we did have films where they had multiple villains, and I think it worked really well here, because Two-Face, in some regards, he's not a villain. It's the origins of becoming a villain, but he's this middle gray area of morality literally called two-face so um i think that's what's so fascinating about the film and how it not just tests the plot but tests its characters and again why you know uh over 10 years later we're still talking about this movie another aspect of the story in the screenplay that i really enjoyed was how they take the creative decision to not give a backstory for the joker I think that's one of the boldest decisions that the filmmakers did on the part of the movie. I think it's so easy to have a villain that's filled with exposition and a lot of baggage. And I think those are the worst kind of villains where instead of understanding their point of view and sort of building empathy towards them, we have this unnecessary baggage that's been built up without really earning it, I suppose, in, in the first place. But in the case of the Joker, the reason why he's so fascinating as a character is because of his origins. He's, he's relatively unknown. I know a lot of comic book writers have dealt with his origin in the past, but for the most part, it's been very unpredictable in terms of where he came from and how he came to be. And the movie does a great job of making sure by that by not including a backstory for the Joker, there's a sense of unpredictability, the sense why we don't know what his next move is going to be, and that creates a sense of dread and tension for the audience. Uh, particularly in the case of Batman, uh, the the driving force in the movie is the Joker trying to force Batman to reveal his identity to Gotham City. Uh, Batman refuses because he has a, a strong moral compass and he believes by doing that he's giving into the demands of the criminal. But it's a very strange one for Batman where in most cases the criminal would give up their, their sort of driving need to give up his identity and carry on with, it, with their pursuits. But in the case of the Joker, as Michael Caine's character sums it up brilliantly, uh, Alfred, some men just want to watch the, the world burn. So the joke is not concerned at all with the consequences of his actions. And it's a, it's a great example of, you know, Batman. It's a, it's a very moral and complex choice that he has to make in terms of revealing his identity or not. And it has major consequences. The more that Batman doesn't reveal his identity, we see that major characters get killed off. So, for example, his girlfriend, Rachel Dawes, gets killed uh, about halfway into the movie. And then we see, of course, Harvey Dent being brutally scarred as Batman saves him. So it's it's so interesting because the Joker really forces Batman to the edge of his moral compass in terms of whether he kills or not. And it's uh, you know one of the great scenes in the movie is when Batman nearly kills the Joker, but because of his moral compass, chooses not to do so. So the Joker is such a fascinating character, and it's one of the most fascinating aspects of the story in the screenplay. But Kat, in terms of the filmmaker's decision to not include a backstory for the Joker, 
Do you think that was beneficial to the movie, or do you think that the movie could have uh, included a few more spots to introduce some of the backstory to his character? No, I think it, it's what I love about the film, for sure. I mean, uh, some of the most iconic scenes of this movie is why are you, why so serious, and you know, you, would you like to know how I got these scars? And him changing the story, him being unpredictable, really goes into all his motives and his movements of the film, where the unpredictability of his origins, again, melts into his unpredictable personality. And you really don't know what he's going to do next, because you don't know if he's lying or if he's not. And it makes him more um, powerful as an as an anarchist. And uh, and I think that's why I enjoyed this movie's version of Joker even more than the Joker film. And, I, and you know, obviously that's a whole different video. But I think some of the aspects I didn't love about the Joker film is that we know who he is. And that's what the whole story is about, is figuring out why does he do the things he does. But this movie, it's like, no, this is, I think this is bleeds more into the Joker of the comic books, which I, I really appreciate. And... You know, you look at other films like Wolverine Origins, um, and I know this is a superhero, but um, I feel like they took a little bit away from Wolverine when we found out what he was all about, you know, uh, when we didn't know, and he was just this random guy from Canada, uh, you know, it made things a little bit more interesting. I'm not saying we shouldn't have, like, the Weapon X story. I think that was important to know that, like, how did he get his claws? Yes. But do I need to know about his 1800s life? No. Or do I need to know about his relationship with Sabretooth? Not in that regard. And I think in some ways that did dilute Wolverine. And we're still seeing that in the comics and movies as well. But yes, the Joker being mysterious is what makes him an interesting character. I don't think every character needs an origin story. Moving on to the acting and character section of the discussion. So I'll kick things off. Just in terms of my one of my favorite performances in the movie is, of course, Christian Bale returning in the role as Bruce Wayne and Batman. And one of the most fascinating aspects of the movie is how Batman's looking to relinquish his duties as a crime fighter and relinquish it to the district attorney, Harvey Dent. It's fascinating because Batman's always held the mantle for being the protector of Gotham City. And when Harvey Dent's brought into the movie, it's, uh, it's, fa- it's fascinating because it's almost like a weight of shul- uh, a weight that's been lifted off the shoulders of the character and it's something that the movies, well, the previous iterations of Batman haven't really covered, per se. And that's fascinating because it allows Christian Bale to dive into the more dramatic aspects of the character, particularly the vulnerable aspects of the character, especially once the joke is introduced. The idea of forcing him to reveal his identity and the various deaths that occur throughout the movie. So Harvey Dent's death, Rachel Dawes' death. It really forces Batman to, you know, become the hero that he's supposed to be and rise above the ashes, as it were. And with Christian Bale's performance, he's so dedicated, he's so committed. He's known for being a, a really an actor that dives into his roles. And this is a great example of it. He, he returns to the role with such ease, with such confidence. He's one of my favourite actors of, uh, of the current generation anyway. And the reason why, that, why that's the case is because one example being that he does a lot of his own stunt work. I know, for example, a lot of the stunt work that you couldn't do, for example, so the Batpod, um, if anyone's seen the behind the scenes uh, footage of the Dark Knight will know that it was a pain to get anybody to manoeuvre the, uh, the Batpod, but he, uh, he was so committed that he wanted to ride the Batpod despite sort of the inherent dangers involved. And that's a testament, testament to uh, Christian Bell as an actor and his overall commitment to the role. And particularly, you know, the vulnerable and dramatic aspects of the character that are revealed as the movie progresses, particularly as... The Joker kills more people. It reveals the more vulnerable aspects of the Batman character. And as a result, it allows Christian Bale to dive into the more dramatic aspects of his acting, something that a lot of these superhero genre pieces don't allow actors all the time. So that when actors, Oscar uh, actors such as Christian Bale are afforded these opportunities, it's really refreshing in these genre pieces to see these actors dive into what they're known for, you know, the, the dramatic indie side, uh, uh, as it were. But Kat, just in terms of Christian Bale's performance within the movie, um, what did you take from it? And do you feel that he has you know, the best portrayal of the Batman character? And where do you think it ranks among the other Batman iterations that we've seen across the movie so far? I think you make some really interesting points about his dramatic um, acting in this film. 
Um, I will say I think he's the best Batman. I don't know if he is the best Bruce Wayne um, because we don't really get to see much of Bruce. I think a lot of his anguish is Batman. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the dramatics come from Batman. And I, in that regard, I still don't think we've gotten the perfect Bruce Wayne. Maybe Batman, at least in film, I think in TV, Batman the anime series is the closest we've gotten um, with that version of Batman. I think really showcases the comic Batman the most and me because that is animation and it it's serialized so it's as close as it can be to a comic book but um yes I do think Christian Bale is the best Batman and I agree I think it's because of how much um dedication he put into the physical aspect and the more dramatic aspect um of his relationship between him and the Joker uh which is why again this film succeeds and again maybe it doesn't succeed as a quote-unquote superhero movie in that regard but i don't think every comic book movie needs to be a superhero movie i know that's weird to say but i think some revel in it and in some scale it back i don't even think every comic needs not every superhero comic has to be um purely superhero i think there's other genres and we've seen that obviously with the marvel films as well so um i think to learn that superheroes just don't mean all right, this is a superhero genre. It's other things going on. And I I think the Dark Knight does that very well. Moving on to the character of the Joker and specifically Heath Ledger's performance. In my opinion, it's one of the best super super villain performances that we've seen on screen to date. The reason why I think that is because of Heath Ledger's absolute commitment and passion for the role. It's definitely there for all to see. And one of the most fascinating aspects of the Joker character is going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, the unpredictability, you know, not knowing what his next move is going to be. And as a result of not creating a backstory for him, coupled with the unpredictability, uh, that choice on the filmmaker's part means that it's there's a sense of uneasiness and sense of tension that's created for the audience that not knowing what his next move is going to be. And in the case of Heath Ledger, he's so fantastic at making the character both scary and also very comedic at the you know the best of times. Um, one of the most fascinating aspects of the character is how he's able to switch between scary and fright and uh, you know comedic at the same time. It's uh, a great example being is during the penthouse scene when the Joker and his criminal uh, buddies um, enter the penthouse to find out where Harvey Dent is. And in that moment, once he infiltrates Rachel Dawes. Um, he finds out quickly that Harvey's, uh, well, Rachel's his, his girlfriend. And in that moment, we see he talks about his wife. And we don't know for sure if they had a relationship, if he had a wife in the first place. That story and that scene particularly, along with the, with the Gamble scene where he threatens to kill Gamble and eventually does kill him. It's fascinating because we start to hear elements of his backstory. And we don't know for sure if it's true or not. And the reason why it's so compelling to watch is because of Heath Ledger's, the way he delivers his lines, uh, the sense of sadness that's underneath his performance, despite sort of the crazy and chaotic elements of his character. We see a sense of pain, the sense where in his, we, we get the sense where in his former life, there was a lot of unhappiness, there was a lot of you know dread and a lot of uh, pain that he suffered. And Heath Ledger does a fantastic job uh, in the role of the Joker. Also the flat character arc that, Jonathan and Chris Nolan decided when writing the character. It just means that Heath Ledger is able to unleash this chaotic and crazy performance without being sort of hindered by any sort of aspects of the story, um, as it were. But yeah, overall, it's one of my favorite performances of all time, not only in the superhero genre, but of all time. But Kat, just in terms of Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker, and specifically his portrayal of the Joker, within this story, because obviously you're a big comic book expert. How do you think it fits in terms of canon, in terms of what we've seen before, and obviously in this film? And yeah, just what's your, your overall thoughts on uh, the performance that Heath Ledger brings? Canon, if it's very well. I mean, what's interesting about the Joker, and I think comics in general, is every decade, every version of a creative team um, is going to put their own spin on the character. You know what the root is, but... They're, they're always going to go different directions. And I think with the Joker especially, we've seen that over the decades. We've seen the, the guy who really just put on face, you know, put on uh, clown makeup and um, he had his BAM uh, gun and that's about it. And he was a little bit more sillier or we have this version that's uh, a bit more intense. And, you know, one thing I really loved about 
Heath's performance is, is kind of what you're touching upon is that there's so many emotions in one scene and the way he emotes them or maybe not even the line is about being sad or about being funny, but you really feel all the dimensions of those emotions in his performance. And yeah, underneath that, this is a, a obviously a very broken um, person, a very demented person and why people should be scared of that. Um, so yeah, but then also, again, bringing up really interesting moral um, plots to Batman. Like when you mentioned, like the boat scene, I was like, okay, do you kill these people or do you kill these people? How do you save everybody you can't? And I think in that regard, um, he's just so fascinating as a character. Um, and Heat's performance just brings that to life. The next character that I want to talk about is Harvey Dent. So in this film, he's played by Aaron Eckhart. And one of the most fascinating aspects of his character is the fact that he is the face for criminal justice, as it were, in Gotham City. And because he doesn't have a cape and a cowl to cover his identity, it's it's really strange and, and fascinating because the citizens of Gotham are, you know, they connect with Harvey Dent in a very personal and visceral way. Whereas I think with the, the Batman character, because they don't know his identity, there's definitely, you know, a mixed vibe that you see in Gotham City, some side with him in terms of taking out the criminals a lot of people particularly the police force don't side with this character because of the fact that he takes justice into his own hands but the reason why harvey dent is so fascinating in this movie is the fact that he is if, effectively if you think about it he is batman without the cape and the cowl because of the fact that he takes out these criminals and he does it in, through legal means we see at the beginning of the movie through the falcone crime family that were establishing batman begins he pretty much takes out all of organized crime in Gotham City, certainly for, as, as the movie alludes to, about a year to year and a half, which is, in Gotham City terms, that's definitely a long time. He's getting, by getting rid of these criminals through legal means, through the court system, it allows the citizens of Gotham to connect with Harvey Dent's character. And that's so fascinating because it plays off Batman's vigilante aspect in terms of taking matters into his own hands. And it, it forces you to think, is Batman doing the right thing? And when Bruce Wayne talks to Rachel Dawes about hanging up the cape and the cowl, he definitely has a point because if you think about it, Harvey's doing the same job, but he's not wearing a cape and cowl and he's not going about a night being criminal to a pub. So that's one of the most fascinating aspects of Harvey Dent's character. And the way that Aaron Eckhart portrays the character, he does so with a sense of stoicism and a sense of heroism as well. Uh, Chris Nolan said that he wanted to uh, you know, cast an actor that had a, an American-like quality. It's sort of similar to Robert Redford that uh, American good looks, that charm that we see in a lot of actors from the 70s, for example. And uh, Aaron Arcot definitely plays off in terms of that aspect of the character, in terms of the stoicism, in terms of the way he portrays the character. And as we see the movie develop in terms of the more dramatic aspects of the character, particularly once it becomes Two-Face, it's so interesting because at the end of the day, they could have very easily veered into, you know, uh, a moustache twirling over the top villain once he becomes Two Face. Um, but it's so fascinating because Chris Nolan and Aaron Haggart made the choice to play the character straight. And I think that's so important because it means that we still understand um, Harvey Dent's point of view and we understand sort of the pain and the vulnerability that he suffered as a result of losing Rachel Dawes. So it allows Two Face to become more than sort of a one dimensional villain. We allow we see sort of his point of view. And as a result of some fantastic writing and great directing from Christopher Nolan, it allows us to build some empathy with the character and understand that whilst what he's doing is not right, we understand that because of what he's gone through in the movie, we understand that he has a specific purpose and that if any of us were in that position, we think long and hard about doing those sort of things that you know Harvey does in the movie. But Kat, just in terms of Harvey's, Harvey Dent's portrayal in the movie, as well as Aaron Eckhart's performance, um, how do you think they did in terms of portraying the character and do you think they did a good job overall i love this character and i think what's so interesting is that he's someone that's forgotten in this film because obviously the joker you know has to outshine him and and does but there's there's so many interesting things about him and i think that goes back to what you're comparing with batman and in two-face or harvey where he he relies on a coin to figure out what's right and wrong and for batman that's obviously wouldn't be the correct thing he's like maybe that's what this world is is just probability i'll just kind of 
see the flip of a coin and that's the right thing. And, and maybe that's the connection to the justice system as well, which I find fascinating. And um, what I really like about his character too is a line, there's so many great quotes in this, but the one of my favorite movie quotes and definitely one of my favorite superhero quotes is that, you know, if you live long enough, um, you, you might be the hero, but then you'll turn into the villain. Obviously, that's not the direct quote, but that's the the idea of it is that you, you live long enough, you'll become the villain. And um, we get to see that he, he was damaged enough that he becomes the villain. But then when you compare it to Batman, he's so damaged, but that's what makes him a hero. Uh, so and I think in, in today's superhero comic book films we don't get enough serious quotes like that just that dig so deep into a character i think dark knight again is riddled with them but if you think about the marvel films it's always like a jokey quote that's from a trailer that people really like like you know thor ragnarok where he's like oh he's the guy from work but you don't get the those you get that dark knight type quote where you're just like why so serious really showcases who the joker is this this villain quote showcases who two faces and i think it's a shame that we don't get those serious moments as much as as we can um and beautiful lines like like we have in this film moving on to the direction of the movie so the dark knight was directed of course by christopher nolan so following up from batman begins the movie and the story as a whole opens up a much larger canvas in terms of as chris nolan put it telling the story of a city and you can definitely tell that, you know, in terms of the locations that we visit, in terms of the various locales that we see throughout the movie, it definitely plays with that larger canvas. Uh, Chris Nolan said himself that one of the big influences that The Dark Knight had was Heat, that was directed by Michael Mann. And you can definitely tell that in terms of just from the opening scene alone, you know, we see that bank heist that the Joker and the various criminals try to attempt in terms of stealing the money from the bank. And we also see a, a cameo from William Fitchner, who was also in Heat as also as a, a very direct nod to, to Heat. But the good thing about The Dark Knight in terms of the story that it tells of the city is that it's never to the detriment of the story. It's always serving the story. It's always serving the wider plot. And I think that's so important when you're telling the story of a city is that, is it serving the story? And if, it's, if the question the answer is yes, then you're definitely doing your job right. A great example of that is when we see Batman going to Hong Kong, which incidentally enough is the first time a live action Batman has traveled outside of Gotham City, which I didn't know until I read the uh, the trivia for the movie. So that was uh, quite fascinating. So when we see Batman in Hong Kong trying to apprehend Lau, the trial boss who resides in Gotham City, but is also, well, he goes to Hong Kong. We see that the reason why Batman is in Hong Kong is that he's trying to apprehend Lau so that he can bring him back to Gotham City, so that Harvey Dent, the district attorney for Gotham City, can apprehend not only Lau, but the entire mob uh, that resides within Gotham City. So that's one of the great examples of how the story and the purpose of the story is weaved into the locales and the various locations that we see in the movie, in that you know, they serve a purpose, and it's not just there for taking off the, you know, the, the various tropes that we see in these uh, genre pieces, as it were. But just in terms of the story itself and more specifically, you know, the direction of the movie, do you did you get the sense that Chris Nolan had a knack for telling the story of the city? And did you think it served the story or did you think it was a, a detriment at times? No, I think that's that's kind of what makes this such a unique film is that the city, it's a character all, all on its own. If if you know anything about Batman, Gotham is very much a character all on its own as well. And it's what births these these villains and what births batman as well um so i think it is really important to establish that and establish the city especially if you know where the trilogy goes and and how it falls in in the next uh in the next film um so it makes the the audience feel a bit more connected for dark knight rises again ironically it's about the fall of, of gotham and and how when you have a fall you can have a rise but um yeah, no, I think it was a great choice that they, they ended up doing that and, and making it such a big part of the film. The final aspect of the direction that I wanted to talk about is the action element that's within the movie. One of the more better aspects of The Dark Knight compared to Batman Begins is how the movie thankfully gets rid of the quick cuts and choppy edits that we see, or that we saw rather, in Batman Begins. That was probably one of my more negative aspects of that movie is how 
you could tell Chris Nunn came from an indie background and he was still sort of learning the mechanics of how to direct a, yeah, a big blockbuster movie, as it were. But you can definitely tell in The Dark Knight he's got a, a better knack in terms of how to frame the action, in terms of how to use you know limited cuts between various characters and various uh, location points. And Chris Nunn, along with cinematographer Wally Fitzer, I'm hoping I'm uh, pronouncing his name correctly. They do you know, a great job of framing the action through the use of wide shots. And they combine that with the use of high key lighting as well as low key lighting as well. They ensure that the action serves a purpose to the story and there's various conflicts within the, within the action as well. Uh, a great example, and one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie is when Batman is trying to stop the Joker from killing Harvey Dent. It's about halfway into the movie, uh, the, the tunnel chase, as it were. And a great example is when uh, the Joker uh, gets a bazooka and he shoots the Batmobile. It then forces Batman to unveil the Batpod. One of my favorite sequences in the entire movie is when we see the Batpod coming out of the Batmobile, which is one of the most surprising aspects and satisfying aspects of uh, the movie as well. And the movie does a great job of setting up conflicts within the action. So it's not just there for, you know, ticking off the, the various tropes that we see superhero films. Um, the great example being is in that particular chase scene, towards the end of the scene, we see Batman on his bat pod trying to kill the Joker. So we think that this in this moment, he's going to break his moral code. The one moral code that he's swore to never do, which is to kill people. And the Joker famously tells him, come on, try and kill me. I know you want to kill me. Uh, but the Batman and Bruce Wayne, he, he cannot find it within himself to kill him, uh, the Joker. That's a great example of how the action blends within the, the conflicts that we see within the, you know, the various characters that reside within the movie. Another great example of conflicts and how it merges within the action is when Batman has to stop the police SWAT team in Gotham from shooting civilians who are dressed as clowns. It's sort of a decoy that the, the Joker set up. And it's a great example of morality. You know, the, the cops, they think that they're criminals, but the Joker, oh, sorry, the Batman knows they're not. So it's a great example of playing with morality and setting up a great conflict where Batman has to save these civilians, dressed as clowns, and stopping the uh, the SWAT team from killing these civilians uh, before before they're uh, killed. It's a great example of how conflict and, you know, the action you know, collide with one another. But Kat, just in terms of the action element of the movie, do you think that Chris Nolan uh, learnt from the lessons from Batman Begins in terms of putting those quick cuts? And um, yeah, what, what were your, just, uh, your overall impressions of uh, the action within the, within the Dark Knight? Yeah, I think he learned, but also I think the action was different because it's the Joker. He's not as physical. Um, in the first movie, it was about Ra's al Ghul, which is so much about hand-to-hand -hand combat. And a lot of the third act had to do with hand-to-hand -hand combat. So um, I would say the action changed, and he, he understood his strengths. I don't know. I think in that regard, that's how he learned. Um, I just don't think we had the same type of action. And what I liked about the action here is how, because obviously you, you have the screenwriter and the director being the same people, which is, you know, why you have such seamless um, direction here. But, um, yeah, I like that it builds tension. And, and you get to see that throughout the script, especially if Joker, again, you get back to the boat scene with the Joker or when you think maybe will Batman kill the Joker? Um, will this end that all? And obviously that's always the ultimate question about between the Joker and Batman is if, if Batman crosses that line to kill this guy does that is that a good thing or a bad thing and that goes back to the moral compass aspect but um yeah it's it's all about building tension and it's it's done so um eloqu eloquently here in uh in this in this film moving on to the soundtrack element of the dark knight so the movie score was done by james newton howard and hans zimmer now with this particular soundtrack mood and atmosphere permeates throughout the entirety of the soundtrack and it's definitely to the movie's benefit the standout track being the joker's theme which is a series of elongated noises and it definitely sells the menace and the threat of the villain within the dark knight uh, now whilst i'm a, a huge advocate for thematic music musical material in movies in the case of the Dark Knight, it definitely wouldn't work. And Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard said themselves that having heroic music or having Batman's theme being uh, throughout the movie, 
it definitely wouldn't fit in with the tone and the style of the movie. And we only hear it a couple of times throughout the movie in terms of Batman's theme. So, I mean, the soundtrack as a whole is definitely serviceable. It definitely functions better within the context of the movie. And whilst I don't think it's a soundtrack that I'll be listening to long after the credits roll, it's definitely a soundtrack that definitely serves the purpose of the story. It definitely doesn't overpower any of the scenes that we see on screen. And it definitely complements the emotions and the tone of the movie, as well as the, uh, you know, the various themes that are present in The Dark Knight. So, Kat, just in terms of your thoughts on The Dark Knight's uh, soundtrack, did you think that it served the tone and the feel of the movie, or did you get the sense that it didn't complement what we saw on screen? I, I definitely think it, it fit the tone, and I do agree. I don't think this is a, a soundtrack I'd listen to over and over again, but it, it definitely did a good job at building that tension that was needed for for this movie and you know Hans Zimmer is definitely known for that and I, I wish I I was a little bit more of a soundtrack buff but I'm not uh but from you know the the average ear it it, it did a good job and um yeah it, it did a good job of building what needed to be built and the the emotions that needed to be built so I'll kick things off just in terms of my overall thoughts the dark knight um with regards to the screenplay and the story It's a complex and multifaceted story from the screenplay by Jonathan Nolan and his brother Chris Nolan. They never lose sight of the characters and what we see on screen is always in service of the story that's constant throughout the movie. Uh, In terms of acting, uh, starting with Christian Bell, who returns in the role as Bruce Wayne and Batman, he returns to the role with such confidence and such ease. and It's a joy to see him do many of his own stunt work. And particularly with the movie, it allows him to dive into the more dramatic side of his character. And we see more of the indie dramatic sensibilities of his acting in the movie. Heath Ledger, in my opinion, gives one of the best villainous performances in a superhero film to date. His chaotic and crazy performance lingers in your memory long after the credits roll. And it serves as a reminder of the commitment and dedication that Heath Ledger brought to the performance as the Joker. In terms of the direction of the movie, uh, with Chris Nolan's decision to expand the story into the wider aspects of Gotham City, it definitely serves the story and that the various locations that we see throughout the film always serve the wider narrative, and he never loses sight of that at any point. In terms of the action element of The Dark Knight, Uh, Chris Nolan definitely has a much better grasp of how to frame the action and how to film it as well. And the decision to use a lot of wide restrained shots, as well as the combination of high key and low key lighting, definitely serves the action a lot better this time around than in Batman Begins. And overall, with the soundtrack as well, uh, it definitely serves the Dark Knight in terms of the tone of the movie. It's never overpowering at any point, and it definitely underlines the emotions of the story and the characters. So whilst it's a a soundtrack that you won't be listening to after the credits roll, it definitely serves its purpose in terms of not overpowering the the raw emotions that we see. And it's a fantastic turn from James Newton Howard and Hans Zimmer. So overall, despite uh, a few nitpicks that I find in terms of pacing, particularly in the second act of The Dark Knight, Uh, I'm going to give the movie a solid 9 out of 10. I don't think it's a perfect superhero film. It gets pretty close, and it's a definite improvement over Batman Begins. But it's a a fantastic movie, and uh, I definitely recommend it for those that maybe haven't seen it in a while. And even if you have, it's definitely worth revisiting every once in a while, just to see the sort of the mastery on screen from Chris Nolan and the various performances that we see in the film. So, Kat, I'll uh, hand it over to you now, just to give your overall thoughts on The Dark Knight. And then, yeah, just rating it on a uh, scale of 1 to 10. I think we're in uh, total agreement here. Uh, I am also rating it a 9 out of 10. Um, it's it's one of my favorite superhero movies. It's one of my favorite movies, period, which is why we're, we're discussing it. And, 
even though I don't think it's a true uh, Bruce Wayne film, and I don't know if it's truly, you know, the comic books, I don't think every superhero movie has to be that. And this does a really great job at actually adapting the comics, which I think movies should and and should continue to do um, as we get to see more superhero movies. We want to see something that's diverse. And I think The Dark Knight really hits the nail on the head of, of the themes of, of Batman and what makes the character special and, and kind of putting in a more realistic, grounded world. Uh, even if it's not like a Spider-Man um, into the Spider-Verse type film where you feel like you you really just watched a, a comic on screen uh it, it's a really important movie and a really important superhero movie that we we really got to see uh dc and warner brothers try to play up with some of their other characters that might have not fit for those characters uh but definitely fits here uh for the overall trilogy so it's it's one of my favorites i think it really grounds not just batman but the villains as well shows exactly why joker is such a powerful villain within literature so uh, i i love this movie i could definitely watch it over and over again and i i can't say that about every superhero movie so it it's nice to to have something like this and it very much lives before the iron man's and the mcu and i think that's a, a special thing yeah, fantastic to hear your thoughts, Kat, with regards to The Dark Knight. And I'm glad we're in agreement in terms of the, the mastery behind the camera from Chris Nolan, obviously the various stand-up performances in the movie. So great to hear your thoughts on the movie. So just before we go, just a quick reminder to the folks watching that if you want to follow myself or Kat on our various social media platforms, uh, you're more than welcome to. So be sure to follow us in the YouTube description below. So I'll post all of our links. So if you want to follow us, you're more than welcome to. But apart from that, it was great to have you, Kat, on the show. Love to have these geek-filled discussions, uh, particularly in this uh, case with the Dark Knight. And as always, I look forward to the next one. Bye, guys. See you.